Okay, welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We are now uh, working on H87 regarding reclassification of crimes. And we are just looking at um, um, fines and um, sections relating to fines in the bill. Um, I know there was a um, small group working on, on this issue. I wanna thank Representative Donnelly um, and Representative Lalonde. I hope I'm not missing any but I'll turn it over to Representative Lalonde now to um, update us and give us some context onto um, into this this portion of the uh, the bill that we'll be looking at. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Chair Grad. Um, so, it, it, there's been kind of an ongoing concern regarding the categorization uh, or the categories that uh, were proposed uh, by the Sentencing Commission and then actually in the bill we passed last year and the bill is introduced this year, uh, that they were really significantly increasing uh, the maximum fine for the various categories that we have uh, for the various misdemeanors and felonies. And so uh, we looked at a couple ways to address that. So uh, we met, uh, Kate Donnelly and I met with Eric and uh, chatted about the issue and looked, just kind of looked at where the fines were, uh, didn't look at every single uh, uh, crime, but took a look at various crimes to see what the current maximum fines were. And yeah, indeed, uh, our increase of the fines was pretty significant. So what we, what we thought was uh, we would try to become more in line with where the fines are currently. And this is not to say that some of the fines would not increase, but it's not by orders of magnitude, uh, particularly when you take into account uh, inflation. A lot of these fines were a you know, $1,000 fine that was put into place in the uh, 70s or 80s is, is you know, 6,000 or so dollars now. Uh, so, so it does. So we're not that far off if you take into account inflation. So we've significantly decreased what the fine levels uh, are uh, in in the proposed uh, categorization. Uh, the other thing, you know, we certainly heard, and and this this guided us as well, uh, is from uh, testimony that we've received that fines really are not that often imposed uh, in, in Vermont. And if they are imposed, they're, they're much lower than what the maximum fines are anyway. So I think we feel fairly comfortable that, that we're at a better place as far as what we're putting in place for the fines. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, drug trafficking fines, I, I believe they're around a million dollars. I mean, they're very, you know, very significant fines. But when we get to those, crimes, we can, we can have an exception. We can have an exception for the, the handful of crimes that really uh, fines are imposed. And I do understand, and this is something we will hear, I think, down the road, maybe not today, but uh, with respect to DUI, uh, fines are more often used, and we may want to take a slightly different approach there. But this bill doesn't address that. And, and, and that we're left open with being able to in those instances where a high fine is in fact justified and is the right thing to do, we can in fact do it when we get to those particular crimes, when we're putting it into the structure. Uh, the other thing, uh, and this was uh, on a suggestion uh, from Judge Zone that uh, we look at uh, main law uh, related to uh, essentially what it would do is codify what we understood from testimony uh, that's already occurring in our courts, which is uh, ensuring that courts, when when they're considering a fine, to take into account the ability to pay of individuals. So, those are the main changes here. I know there there are a few changes that are in the bill as well that that we've discussed before, and and certainly we'll let let uh, Eric just point out those. I think that nothing really new is stuff that we've discussed as far as uh, some of the penalties. For, for a handful of the crime. So with that, I'll, I'll turn that over to Eric for a more official walkthrough. And I'm wondering if Kate had anything to add to that, certainly, uh, but I think I hopefully covered covered that. Yeah, I think it sounds, sounds good to me. All right, thanks, Kate. Okay. 
Um, and actually, Eric, you know what, before we turn to you, I do see that coach is here and um, coach, are you able to register your vote on H133 now? Just so we can tie that up. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're ready. <laughs> too, 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 too many, too, I, I was typing another message to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. Christy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, okay, great. All right, thank you, Eric. Go ahead. Sorry, I was having a bit of problem with my <clears throat> my mute button there. <laughs> Seems to be behaving behaving properly now. Now I now I mean. <laughs> All right, uh, Eric Fitzpatrick again with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Nice to see everybody again this afternoon. Here to talk a little bit today about uh, H87, um, in particular to look at some of the changes that have been made uh, between the bill as introduced, which the committee has already looked at and which I've done a walkthrough of previously, but now we've got a, a new version of committee strike all amendment that ha has a couple of changes in yellow highlight. So if that's okay with the chair, I'm gonna move right to the document. All righty, so again, we're on H87, which is an act relating to establishing a classification system for criminal offenses. This is, uh, as Representative Lalonde was just mentioning, the bill that takes the existing provisions of Vermont criminal law and categorizes them uh, into a series of classes, A through E felonies and A through E misdemeanors, uh, and the amount of the incarceration period, as well as the amount of the fine are both vary with respect to uh, the class of offense that it's in. So each class has a specified range or a specified maximum of imprisonment, as well as a specified maximum fine. The um, existing categories you see there in section 52, A through E, as I mentioned, are felonies and they give the maximum prison uh, lengths, as well as uh, the maximum prison lengths for misdemeanors are next in subsection B. And then we get to the fines, which the chair was just referring to, because remember each penalty in, in uh, each crime, I should say, uh, under the Vermont statutes, uh, for the most part has a maximum period of incarceration as well as a maximum fine, although there are some, some offenses that are fine only. And we may see a couple of those today. So the very first thing that, that the amendment proposes to do, which uh, Representative Lalonde mentioned a few minutes ago, you'll see that in the bill as introduced, uh, the fine range uh, for each, in this case, subsection A is what you're looking at first. These are the felonies, They're the class A through E felonies. The fine for each specific felony class is reduced, uh, is proposed to be reduced, I should say, in this amendment that you're looking at now. So for example, the class A felony as introduced had a maximum fine of $500,000, the proposal here in the amendment is to drop that to $100,000. So the maximum fine for a class A felony, if someone committed a crime that fit into the class A category uh, under this proposal would be $100,000. So similar as you look down through each of the five felonies, A through E, uh, the maximum fine is reduced each time. So from B, it's reduced from 250,000 to 50,000. For C, it's from 50,000 to 25 for D from 25 to 10, and for a class E felony, which is the lowest range of felony, it's from 15,000 to 7,500. So similarly, you'll see with respect to the misdemeanors. So moving on to subsection B here, the misdemeanors uh, also have five classes, A through E. Uh, the proposal as introduced, um, see the uh, uh, proposal for each misdemeanor, uh, runs from $10,000 for a class A, and this, this was as introduced, 
down to $250 for a class E. And there should be a, a strike through in the first three lines there, A through C, that's a, a typo that we're looking at. So the proposal of the amendment is to change the maximum fine for a class A misdemeanor, that's on line three, from $10,000 to $5,000. So the 10,000 should be struck through with the yellow highlighting. The uh, proposal for class B is similar uh, in the sense that it reduces it by half. So it's a $5,000 fine in the bill as introduced, but it's a $2,500 fine under the proposed amendment. Uh, for a class C misdemeanor, the $2,500 fine in the bill as introduced is proposed to be reduced to 1,000. So that would be a $1,000 maximum. Now you see for class D and E, those re the proposal includes um, the same fines as introduced. So there would be no changes to D or E. The maximum for D would remain $500 and the maximum for E would remain 250. So that's the first, there's sort of three real uh, separate provisions of this amendment. That was the first one, a, a overall reduction in the maximum amount of fines for uh, felonies and misdemeanors. So that's point one. Uh, so before I get to the second piece, which is right here, which is the, the, the taking into account of ability to pay when determining the amount of a fine, I can pause for a moment just to see if there's any questions on, on uh, this part one, which is the specific reduction of maximum fine amounts for felonies and misdemeanors. Again, folks, if I'm not seeing your hand, please, please jump in. Okay, I don't, I don't think so. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Sure. So moving on to the second, um, the second element of the amendment, again, as, as uh, Representative Lalon mentioned, this was a suggestion from Judge Zone about, uh, and I think it was in response to, to some discussion the committee was having about whether or not when setting the amount of a fine, remember those fine amounts that uh, under existing law, as well as in, in the proposal for H87, those fine amounts are maximums. So uh, that doesn't mean that, that the court has to set it as a maximum or that it, that it does so in any majority of cases. That's just the maximum amount that is possible. So the court determines what the fine should be uh, within that range. And so what subsection C here proposes, again, uh, a reflection of what we understand to be practice anyway, is that when determining what the amount is going to be and when it's going to set what the fine is going to be, keeping in mind what the maximum is, uh, as well as the method of payment. So that's on line eight. So when the court determines the amount and the method, in other words, you're going to have to pay right away. Uh, can it be in credit card installments? You know, th th those sorts of things will go to the method. Um, the court uh, shall, you see, that's important in line nine. It's not a may, it's a shall. The court shall consider the defendant's present and future financial ability to pay the fine. So it takes into account, the court must take into account uh, the defendant's circumstances in terms of ability to make that fine payment, uh, as well as uh, going on in line 10, the nature of the financial burden the payment of the fine will impose on the defendant and any dependents of the defendant. So what kind of, you know, what ability do they have? In other words, what their resources are is sort of the first clause. And the second part of that is, um, you know, even irrespective of what their resources are, making the payment of the fine will impose what type of burden on, on the defendant and the defendant's depend dependents. And those factors are required to be taken into account when the court determines what the fine should be for the particular offense. So uh, I should, I should met, Representative Lalonde mentioned this as well. I think I, I didn't mention it, but this language is, uh, while not verbatim based on a statute that is the law in Maine, it's based very much on, on the language of a Maine law that's in existence right now. And so I, that's where uh, Judge Zoni forwarded it to me and I use it as the basis for this language. So um, very similar to what the Maine statute provides. So subdivision two, um, has to do with the burden of proof. So what happens uh, when the defendant makes an assertion that they don't have the ability to pay? Well, the defendant who asserts present or future inability to pay has the burden of, pro of proving that inability by a preponderance of the evidence. So it, it falls upon the defendant who makes that assertion to show, and we will remember, we've discussed this quite a bit, that preponderance is more likely than not, uh, 51 to 49, for example, in terms of percentages. This is one way to sort of visualize it. 
but more likely than not, uh, if the defendant can make that showing that they, they don't have either right now or in the future the ability to pay, um, and they can successfully make that argument, then, then uh, the court can make that finding. Moving on to subdivision three, uh, this is the second sort of piece that the, the defendant can argue, because remember, they can, they can argue not only that they don't have the present or future ability to pay, also that, the, that there's going to be uh, a financial burden on the defendant or any of the defendant's dependents, and that also is something that uh, the court is required to take into consideration by the language in C1. So, so paragraph three says, so if the defendant makes that assertion that the, that the fine is gonna cause an excessive financial hardship for the defendant or defendant's dependents, then again, a defendant has the burden of proving that excessive hardship by a preponderance of the evidence. So the defendant has to bring forward some evidence, some uh, uh, indication, some facts from which the court could make the finding uh, about the amount of the fine to impose based on excessive hardship to the defendant. So again, those two pieces are just right out of the uh, main statute, but it preserves a similar kind of procedure uh, for the court to follow if a defendant is asserting that they either don't have the ability to pay or that it's going to cause an, an excessive financial burden. And then the court takes those um, those facts into account when it sets the amount of the fine. So, Eric, I, I think uh, Bob. Yeah, Dor Bob. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Eric. <clears throat> I'm not saying I agree, disagree with any of this. Uh, like under number two and number three, where it says by a preponderance of the evidence, is that does that appear in the main statutes also? Yes. Yep. I guess I'm a little confused, and, and I'm just looking for a little uh, uh, clarification here. I'm assuming when they say a defendant who asserts the present or future inability to pay a fine shall have the burden of proving the inability, I would, I would think, period. But it goes on by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, I assume they bring in like their, their tax returns or their bills. or Could you give me an example of the preponderance of the evidence? Yeah, I think that you're exactly right. It would be factors like those. It could be, you know, a pay stub, could be a bank account statement, could be uh, any any indicate. It could be the, the defendant's own oral testimony, oral statements about what they have. Um, but as you mentioned, it could be a tax tax statement as well. Any sort of listing of mm -hmm. assets and resources that they have. Uh, all of those all of those indicators of financial ability would all be relevant and. Uh, um, and would all, I think, uh, be appropriate for the court, for the defendant to, to present and for the court to take into account when it, when it made the decision. So I think you're on the right track. Okay, well, I'd hope they'd have to provide some documents, not just uh, a verbalization of what they can and can't afford, but I mean, uh, proving the inability is, is, is one thing, but uh, showing documents is another, I guess, but that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Oh. Okay. Okay. Great. Should I have move ahead? Please. Thank you. Okay. So that was the second concept. Remember, so the first one we've gone through the two two different sort of elements of this amendment. The first being the blanket uh, reduction of all the fine maximums for felony and misdemeanors, and now also a requirement that the court take into account ability to pay when it sets the amount of the fine. The third piece is really just several individual uh, offenses in which the um, the penalty, for, remember these are property offenses, in which the penalty has been switched from following the, the, um, the uh, property fine structure, the property penalty structure, I should say. Remember the way the property offenses uh, structure is classified is that it depends upon the amount of property that's involved in the offense right? it's sort of uh, there's a scale or a, a step system based on the amount of property that's involved so the lowest one if it's less than a hundred dollars class d misdemeanor very low uh very low offense whereas the maximum uh if it's equal to or greater than one hundred thousand dollars subdivision five it's a class d felony which is uh, five years imprisonment, $10,000 fine, that's the maximum. And it ranges between 
uh, those two, depending on the amount of property that's involved. So for the majority of property offenses, you simply have said, uh, for example, that I'm just picking out an example here. So there's an example right there, lines 13 and 14, typically, not every time, but typically, uh, the property offenses say, well, the person shall be sentenced per pursuant to, and it cross-references those three sections that set out what we were just looking at, that set out how the punishment varies depending on the amount of the property involved, the value of the property involved. There's a few individual offenses in which rather than rather than follow that structure, remember we, we went through that whole chart that I put together uh, over the last couple of meetings on this bill, in which we went through each specific property offense and saw which ones followed the structure, like you see in the language that we're looking at right there, or and I'm going to move right to one of the changes now because it's a good example of what we're talking about, or um, didn't follow the structure and instead put the offense within a particular delineated class. So that's uh, the proposal that you'll see here, for example, and this has to do with the counterfeiting paper money statute that the committee uh, spent some time talking about uh, over the last couple of meetings. This basically is, uh, you know, <coughs> making fake counterfeit <coughs> paper money. And uh, the uh, there was a great discussion about whether that happened in Vermont frequently anymore or not, and was a, a testimony that it does happen occasionally. But the bill as introduced, you'll see, um, had the penalty provision set up to follow the structure that we just talked about. So this is line seven and eight, the highlighted language. When the bill is introduced, said, all right, the penalty, the, the, person, the person who commits this is going to be sentenced under those sections 52, 53, and 55, which means, again, the penalty varies depending on the value of the, of the amount of money counterfeited. So the proposal here is to change that to the class D felony, uh, which is actually, as I mentioned, the, the highest of the property crime categories. It's a five years uh, maximum imprisonment, $10,000 maximum fine. And it's one, a very interesting one too. And we talked about this as well. If you look at line six and seven, it has this odd 14 year maximum in current law. I have no idea where that came from. You know, usually there are multiples of five. So where the 14 came from, I really don't know. But it is uh, by property offense standards, a fairly, um, a fairly severe sentence. So I think the proposal here is to go to the most severe of the property categories, which is class D, the five-year maximum, rather than have it vary uh, based on the amount of property involved, which it could be as low as 30 days, for example. So that exact same thing, a change from the categorization to a class D felony is exactly what happens in two other offenses. And that's, that's this third change that we're talking about, just the change to class D felony for three offenses, the first being counterfeiting of paper money, the other two being embezzlement, usually from positions of trust. So here we are, embezzlement by an officer or servant of a, of a bank, for example. You'll see under current law, lines 14 and 15, that's a 10-year felony. Um, under the bill as introduced, uh, it, it had the punishment follow the categories, which again, could be as low as 30 days, um, depending on the amount of money embezzled. So the proposal again here is to change that to a class D felony. So embezzlement from an op by, by an officer of a incorporated bank would uh, have a class D felony penalty associated with it. Same thing with embezzlement by a receiver or trustee appointed by the court in, a, in state litigation. So that's someone, again, position of trust appointed by the court who embezzles or converts the property that they're uh, meant to be trustee over or receiver for. And again, that penalty goes from the uh, categorization, which can vary greatly, to a class C felony, which is five years, $10,000 maximum. Again, the existing law penalty for, for that you see in line one is 10 years, $1,000. And I think that's the last one. I'll just double check, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, yeah. And so that will. I think there was one more correction, uh, Eric. Um, yeah. Trying to find that. It, that would have been on around page 30. It's the tapping gas pipes with intent to do. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Thank there. you. Yep. Thank you, Representative Lana. There it was right there. Again, changing that from a class A misdemeanor to a class B misdemeanor was the. 
um, the proposal here as, as introduced, or sorry, an existing law. It, it's a one year, $100 misdemeanor. And the proposal here is to go from class A to class B, the proposal of the amendment, I should say. Great. Thank you. Yeah, just make sure that's the last one, but I believe it is. Yep, looks like we're clear. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Any uh, questions for Eric before we move to our witnesses? Not seeing any. Okay, uh, Rebecca Turner, are you available? Welcome. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General's Office. Uh, thanks for having me back on this latest version. And it's, it's great to see a lot of my um, points that I made during a previous testimony on, on the concerns of this uh, being addressed here. And so uh, I think I thank this latest version and um, wanted to just clarify, because I, I heard the intro remarks. I just wanted to clarify in terms of the new proposed find schedule. Uh, I understand that across the board, the fines now proposed are lower on the max. But what I haven't been able to confirm is whether or not they are in fact lower or higher than any of the currently listed identified fines on the books. Um, it's, it, I don't want to. I don't want to ask the question. It's just that my 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 position on that uh, depends on the answer, and I just wasn't clear from the introductory remarks on that. Okay, um, I can turn to Eric if that would be helpful. I don't have an answer to that question. The, the each specific offense, you'd have to go through each specific offense uh, and and make that comparison. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that there are going to be some that that the uh, fine is is going to be greater under this. Uh, I'll I'll just give you an example of one that we've just looked at, uh, and that is uh, the counterfeiting uh, law, and the fine there is one thousand dollars, and we're saying that it's going to be a class D felony, which I believe we have that as a ten thousand dollar fine. So there there is definitely an increase there. Yeah. You know, I will note, however, that you know we're addressing the 14-year uh, incarceration period, and we're putting it in line with uh, the going so-called going rate. We looked into that for counterfeiting, and uh, the there were sentences that were a maximum of 1.5 years. Uh, some deferred sentences were a maximum of 3.8 years. So we really thought the five years was appropriate there. But I haven't done it with this particular crime. I'd have to, I, I can do it fairly quickly by looking in the green book. Uh, but if you take into account inflation, uh, we're not that far off uh, for a lot of these $1,000. You know, I, I did look at some of the other ones and, and saw that there was a $1,000 fine imposed in like the mid 70s for one of the crimes. I'd have to double check again. And, and that's the equivalent of about $7,000. Uh, today. Um, so th the answer is, yeah, you'd have to go crime by crime. And, and there are definitely going to be some that, that are higher uh, fines, uh, but definitely not of the same magnitude as we were talking about before. Thank you for that, that clarification. So in response to that, uh, our position would be, and, and this is consistent with the uh, position I made earlier, which is that really there should be a complete uh, abolition of fines uh, entirely uh, for the reasons talked about before. In terms of, of having the effect of any one of these crimes result in an increase in fines, I think that is unsupported uh, based on the testimony we've heard uh, crime research group. Uh, I, my understanding is that, and from the judge's testimonies, uh, the fines being imposed aren't reaching those max limits currently on the books. So to propose new laws increasing the fines, um, I just want to make it clear our, our objection to that continues. 
But I wanted to turn and focus my uh, points on the ability to pay new language in the bill, which is really great to see on um, page three. And what I wanted to do there was focus on a sub part of that, which is who has the burden. Um, here, as proposed in the bill, uh, language would have the defendant, while, while the court's required to consider the defendant's present and future ability to pay, the reading of this bill indicates it's actually the defendant who has to present evidence of an inability to pay, and not just that, but by a preponderance of the evidence. And I understand that that language is taken from Maine. I quickly took a look and saw that that appears to be true. Uh, I would just note that we don't have that type of burden shifting in our sentencing scheme. And specifically, I look at our restitution statute 7043D, uh, which similarly requires a court prior to imposing a restitution. Again, restitution is part of sentencing, similar to fines. Uh, it serves a different purpose, but again, they're both within the sentencing structure. So I think that is extraordinarily useful for this committee to look at how 7043, 13743D2 uh, uses language there in terms of requiring the court to, uh, here's, here's what, Oh, I had it tabbed here, and now I lost it. But it requires the court to make a finding on ability to pay without putting any burden on the defendant. And we have considerable case law developing and reversing trial judges' failures to adequately make findings on ability to pay. And so what we have is um, insight as to how that's understood, and that is that if there is no evidence before the court at time of imposing sentencing on ability to pay, then it's on the state to prove ultimately that there is in fact an ability of the defendant to pay the amount of restitution imposed. And the case law of the Supreme Court has identified certain things that the court can look at. Um, in fact, the statute, I finally have my book out. The statute says, Offenders' current ability to pay restitution based on all financial information available to the court, including information provided by the offender. So that's the, that's the language I would recommend this committee adopt in, um, in this proposed bill. Uh, again, it's currently on the books. We have case law developed, you know, identifying it so the parties know it's consistent with sentencing. Uh, and there, of course, Ultimately, the court can't make any findings on ability to pay without evidence. Uh, you can look at if someone is has applied for a public defender, um, has shown herself to be indigent, those papers are before the court and are relied on in a restitution hearing um, that can be relied upon here. In fact, uh, I would suggest that there should be a presumption of inability to pay upon an indigency uh, determination. Uh, but short of that, certainly the paperwork is directly relevant. I think the the point I'm making and how our statutory scheme is set up uh, is consistent with federal and state constitutional requirements that provide us some important context to this. Uh, we know that a court cannot impose excessive fines. Um, otherwise, that would contradict the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against excessive punishment. We have something similar in our Vermont Constitution uh, requiring sentences be proportional. So what we know about how we understand excessive punishment, proportional uh, punishment, uh, it makes sense that you look at a person's income or ability to pay the sentence when it's a monetary fine, monetary penalty. Again, if you turn back to who has that burden, the court under law cannot impose a fine that a defendant cannot pay. So if a defendant just fails to bring in the paperwork on the latest income stubs, that doesn't absolve a court from imposing a fine that's not excessively um, in, in excess of his ability to pay. So I just would suggest striking that language on page three, um, that would be C2 um, and C3. I think that's right. I think that's 
Do you mean striking that entire, those uh, C2 and C3 in their entirety? I think, yes. Uh, let's see, his C2 and C3 talk about the burden there. What I like about two or C3 is that it, it points to considerations of, of uh, the dependents, of the defendant, right? And that, that's a great, great thing to see. I wanted to share that while well, Judge Zone pointed the committee to Maine, Texas has a similar statute requiring a judge to find ability to pay, uh, and they passed that in 2017. And I can give the uh, link, but for the record, it's SB 1913. There, in their legislation, there's no burden on the defendant uh, to produce an ability to pay. And they produced a bench card and again listed some useful things to look at, but also to consider not just limiting it to the dependents, but um, there could be other family members, just essentially broadening the potential relevant factors that a judge may consider to be hardships in a particular person's case. So to the extent that three suggest those are the only things that, uh, that a judge can look at, a defendant's own personal income requirements and then the defendant's own dependents, I think that's an unnecessary limitation. And there are examples out there of what are proper and more expansive to give the full uh, picture of what financial hardships are involved in that person's life. I think that is, those were the main points I wanted to make this afternoon. So I'll pause here if there are any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Martin, did you have any other? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Questions. Um, so I just wanna make sure I understand this as well. So it, does it matter if um, there's been an indigent, in, sorry, my indigency, uh, I'm, I'm saying that wrong for some reason. Uh, the, the determination that is made going into the case, does it matter if that uh, is, has been made before you determine whether to have the burden of proof on an individual or not? Uh, are you saying, are you asking that question in the context of restitution? Well, no, no, I, in the context of, uh, of this, of this uh, bill that we're talking about in this provision. Right? Well, I, I think my point is, is that the defendant can introduce and, and share information relevant, um, but in a, in a, in a in a moment where there is no evidence available, uh, the court should look at whatever is available um, that's been filed. And so applications for public defender uh, services would be there or anything or earlier, right? Um, there was some discussion in a Vermont Supreme Court decision where they even considered the imposition of a 24 hour curfew as uh, providing some insight on the ability of someone to go out to their job. Right? How much can they do from home? That, those kind of things that give inference. Uh, but no, I think that if the question is, should, is there a way to leave the language imposing a burden on the defendant in the, in the bill? Well, yeah, let me say, I mean, if, if, the, if the defendant hasn't been deemed to be indigent, uh, should there be a burden on that individual to show inability to pay? Yeah, I understand if there's been an indigency uh, uh, determination before that, that that presumption should be the inability to pay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm just wondering, maybe, maybe that's making too fine a point of it. Uh, I understand. Well, I, and I, I think, I think the, the, the bottom line is that a judge has to rest its ruling, his rulings on some evidence. And so there has to be some evidence in the record to find. If, uh, if the defendant doesn't provide evidence, uh, then the state has to provide evidence. And that's certainly how it plays out in the restitution proceedings. Again, who is seeking the punishment here? It's the state. So it, for the state to support its request or defined to be relevant here appropriate, it's, it is a natural place to turn to in terms of where there is no evidence before the judge to make this ruling and the state is seeking a fine imposed of a certain amount. And the defendant, had, there's no information before the court and the defendant is not going on the stand or providing anything. And it is on the state to produce some evidence to support that. 
uh, amount. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, seeing anybody else? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see that Judge Treadwell is here and I just wanna um, see if you have any time constraints and um, if, you, if you'd like to, to go next, I just wanna give you that opportunity. I have no time constraints until four o'clock, so I'm happy to fit into the committee schedule um, wherever that works best. Okay, um, well, why don't, why don't you go ahead? I don't think we'll go that late, but why don't you go ahead just in case? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, again, my apologies for uh, being late. I got stuck in court. Um, uh, I've had an opportunity to take a look at uh, draft 1.1 of H87. Um, I, I caught the tail end of um, Attorney Turner's um, presentation. Um, I, I think, I, I'm not sure I have many comments. Um, uh, reducing the fines in the classification schedule is, um, I think, a policy choice that is really not a matter for the judiciary, it's what the legislature believes the appropriate maximum fine should be for the different classes of offenses. Um, the other changes that are proposed with respect to certain property crimes, uh, assigning them to a classification, I think it's the same issue. Um, and then with respect to uh, the, the C1, 2, and 3 provision relating to making a determination of fines. Um, I, I'm not sure that the judiciary has a uh, particular, any position on who should bear the burden. Um, I would note that uh, the vast majority of fines in the vast majority of cases are negotiated between the state and the defense attorney and are set pursuant to the plea agreement. Um, it strikes me as problematic that the court would then have to make an, an independent determination of ability to pay where the state and a represented defendant have negotiated the amount. So perhaps if the burden is not to be placed on the defendant, there should at least be a burden of production that the defendant has to raise the issue that the court must address ability to pay um, in a particular case so that if it has been negotiated, the court doesn't have to stop and make an independent finding based on some evidence, you know, who knows what it would be with respect to um, ability to pay. Uh, the information that is contained in public defender applications is frequently, frequently very summary indeed, and may in fact be several years old by the time the court is imposing a sentence. So there may just not be much information available for the court to make a determination on that point. Um, beyond that, if there are questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Great, thank you so much. I do see Selena has her hand up. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I found um, the, I went and looked at the restitution statute and found that to be a really helpful suggestion from the previous witness to kind of potentially track the mm -hmm. language around fina financial need there. And I, I just, your, um, what you shared about plea agreements had me wondering, because restitution would also be the subject to a plea agreement yes no would that be part of the negotiation the same negotiation it's sort of separate and distinct the court is obligated by statute to consider restitution in any case where a victim um, experiences a material loss um, the the practice is that from my experience is that there frequently is a negotiation between the parties and preparation of a separate restitution judgment order re relating to payment of restitution and there is frequently um, agreement between the state and the defendant as to whether the defendant has in fact an ability to pay. Um, when there is not an agreement, the, um, 
the, it, it can make setting restitution quite complicated uh, because then um, you, frequently orders have to be issued requiring disclosure of tax information and things like that, in my experience. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Ken. So let me get this right. So it's really not the courts. We're, we're changing these fees and the and uh, and uh, resummarizing all the uh, the laws or whatever it's called. But it's really not the courts that's doing it. It's really done before you see it. So um, in the vast majority of cases, and I'm sure someone from either uh, the attorney general's office or the defender general's office has the current figure, but I think it is far beyond 90%. But in more than 90% of cases, there is a plea agreement entered in the case between the parties that actually the parties agree to the sentence that the court will impose. Um, so the court is not making an independent determination of the sentence to be imposed in the case beyond determining that the agreed sentence is in fact in the interest of justice. Did that answer your question? Uh, maybe, but I'm going to ask another one. So the this this reclassification and this money, everything that we're, we're, we're doing right now, really, when you're pass down your judgment, really is following these new guidelines of what we're trying to pass here. That makes sense? Yes. Um, I, you know, classification completely um, reorganizes the way uh, criminal penalties and punishments are assigned across Vermont's criminal statutes. Currently, the way it is done is that each separate statute has its own separate penalty provision that the legislature has enacted at a specific time. What this does is it creates a classification scheme and sorts all crimes into uh, classes A through F, misdemeanor and felony, and then the legislature can decide where specific crimes should go. What the classification does is it sets the maximum penalty that could be imposed as punishment, uh, whether that is negotiated between the parties or imposed by the court at a contested sentence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up a little bit on what uh, Selena was asking about as well. And, and just looking at the restitution law and looking at what we have here, certainly uh, in this proposal, it, it does spell out a, a burden of uh, proof there. Uh, it doesn't in the restitution. And I guess the question I would have for you, just to, to make sure I really understand this, is if that if we did not have uh, C2 and 3, which is where the burden is placed, and we only had the language in C1, it seems like that's pretty close to just what we have in the restitution law. And how would that play out? I mean, what, what does that do as far as what a court's consideration would be? And maybe you've already answered it by talking about what happens in the restitution law, but. Um, so as I understand the Vermont Supreme Court's restitution decisions, the court has determined based on the language in the restitution statute that the court must find an ability to pay in order to order restitution. Um, and uh, the, the burden on establishing the ability to pay is effectively on the state. Um, if C2 and C3 were not included and it was just C1, that would arguably leave open the question of who has a burden. Um, and 
I, I, it would be subject to litigation as to where the burden is assigned and how it is assigned. Um, as I understand it, the court cannot impose an excessive fine and the court also cannot, um, the court must consider an ability to pay um, when seeking to imprison a person for failing to pay. And that most often comes up not in the fine context, but in the context of failure to pay child support. Um, it's not clear to me that that necessarily requires that the state bear the burden in all cases. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I'm seeing anybody else. No. Great. Thank you. Thank you so right. much. Good to see you. Thank Appreciate you very you. much. Always yeah. happy to help out. Great. Great. Thank you. Take good care. Um, okay. James Pepper. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, so I will go through the bill, uh, H87 draft 1.1, section by section, starting with the fines. It sounds like that's probably the most, um, you know, relevant uh, for today's conversation. Um, the bottom line for the state's attorneys is we've supported more consistency in the fine structures as opposed to the more ad hoc approach that's used to developing fines currently. Um, but we don't feel strongly one way or the other, given the kind of historic use of fines. Um, and keeping in mind that uh, judges already are considering ability to pay, um, you know, and not imposing excessive fines. I, I don't see, I don't see section C2 or three as an inappropriate burden shift um, because already at this point, um, the state has proven all of the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, and that this is an appropriate legislatively imposed penalty. Um, but that being said, um, it doesn't seem like section two or three actually add all that much to the conversation. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that they need to be in this bill at all. Um, um, you know, I, I think about kind of some of the other instances where courts consider ability to pay restitution, certainly one of them. Um, there's a informa pauperis where the courts can consider waiving fees um, based on ability to pay. Um, that has certain criteria that could you could look at, um, you know, whether someone is on federal assistance for, um, for food or, or housing, um, whether someone falls behind a certain percentage of the poverty line. But honestly, just I think having the courts consider ability to pay like they do in bail determinations, um, spelling that out, I think is the important thing, whether someone wants to prove it, you know, by a preponderance or not, I, I just, I don't see that as being really essential to the conversation. Um, what I like about considering ability to pay is that the courts considering it is it can cut in both directions. I mean, essentially, you know, for people that can pay and see, you know, fines kind of just as the cost of doing business sort of, you know, with, for instance, like speeding, um, you know, I think, you, you know, sometimes people should, should pay, you know, more towards the higher end of the fine structure if they can, um, because then it has kind of a more it's more of a deterrent effect. Um, whereas, you know, I, I don't think we're seeing um, huge fines or uh, fines being imposed really on people, particularly people that are represented by public defenders. Um, so I, I don't actually have a real problem with C2 or three coming out um, and just saying the court shall consider ability to pay um, and just formalizing that, which is something that they do already. Thank you. I see. Ken has his hand up. But, but again, the, the deal is made before it gets to the judge, right? And then the judge is just agreeing to what the, what the deal, uh, what, what, uh, what the deal was made between the, the defendant and uh, stuff, correct? 
in the uh, in the vast majority of cases that are resolved by plea agreement, right? But of course, the plea agreement has to be approved approved by the judge, and the judge could at that point consider ability to pay. And does but, the judge? So I mean, this isn't a question for you, but does a judge usually override the plea deal? Uh, pr pretty in infrequently, um, if there's something. If it looks like a miscarriage of justice uh, for one reason or another, or if a victim hasn't been consulted properly um, and had a chance to, to weigh in, uh, a judge might halt a plea deal or um, uh, just ask for something different, but it's very infrequent for a judge to override a, a plea deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm still looking at uh, the restitution language as well, and it seems to behoove us to have the language for the fines and the language for the restitution, or the concept, I should say, be equivalent, because I could see that someone's unable to, you know, if we put the burden on the, if we put the burden on the defendant in one and not the other, uh, it could end up that it's determined that the defendant has to pay one and not the other. I don't know if that made any sense, but but I, I think there's just there makes it seems to make some sense to me. And I guess if you could comment on that to have these at the same level as far as restitution and fines, just I, have different standards. It bothers me at least. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't bother you, but it's. I guess I would want to go back and really look at the restitution restitution statutes. I, I, you know, I just, I don't know how much uh, really information we would have about a person's finances uh, the state would have in order to meet this burden. So I, I mean, I just assume really just take it out. Um, you know, if it's going to be a burden on the on the state, um, I don't I don't really see that us the state really meeting that burden. Um, you know, someone has, again, like for a public defender application, it's it's really just kind of a, a sworn statement that, that you don't have the, that you meet the criteria for public defender eligibility. You know, no one's really investigating whether those are accurate or not. And no one really has the real ability to do that. So to me, this is, you know, the whole idea of, of the burden of proof here, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's just very useful to the conversation. Um, especially considering how infrequently fines are imposed. All right, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Okay, great. Well, thank you. If you Do had you, anything else to add or? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, I had comments on the rest of the sections, but honestly, you know, they're, they're all, you know, I think this, this draft is uh, in better shape than the prior draft. I think it, it um, so it we're, and we were, so I don't really have much more to add at this point. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Okay, um, David Scher, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, David Scher with the Attorney General's Office. I don't actually believe we've testified on this bill yet, and I'll just say for the record that the Attorney General's Office does support this legislation. Uh, we think it makes sense to make the uh, penalties, including fines, more consistent across the board, and also to have a, um, uh, a bias in this legislation towards reducing penalties is appropriate and bringing them more in line with actual sentencing practices um, again, is an appropriate policy outcome that we support. Um, we supported the legislation that uh, encouraged the production of this bill uh, through the Sentencing Commission, which did put the put a finger on the scale towards uh, reducing penalties in the direction of consistency with actual sentencing practices. So, uh, for all those reasons, we do support the legislation. Think it's a good move forward. I'll. I don't have a lot to say on the current draft. I think it is looking in good shape. I know that the conversation today has mostly been about the fine issue. I largely agree with uh, Attorney Pepper with respect to the practical impact here. Um, 
the vast majority of cases that go through our system uh, are public defender cases, meaning somebody's very low income, um, lacks the ability to pay for an attorney is around the federal poverty line. In very few of those cases, would you see a fine as part of the ultimate penalty? Uh, they just aren't used that often. It's not a big part of our criminal justice system and our penalties in Vermont. You may see a little more often in certain contexts like DUI cases, which tend to span the socio socioeconomic spectrum in a way that you see less of for other uh, types of offenses uh, as, the, as they're prosecuted anyway. Um, I think that the more important uh, fine asset, or I should say cost assessment that's being imposed on defendants is actually the restitution scheme, which is a scheme that attempts to make victims whole. I think that that process is really the important one when we think about assessing costs on a defendant. Um, and that system I think is, is well established and working well. I don't, I certainly think that this is a good idea. New subsection C is a good idea and support it. Um, again, I think it's going to be something that is relatively unusual that there is going to be a weighing out of uh, ability to pay in these cases for the reasons I mentioned, uh, both that um, uh, fines are a relatively unusual part of our system. And also that, as others have mentioned, a huge, it's actually greater than 99% of our cases are resolved by plea agreement. Uh, so for all those reasons, um, support the bill, uh, support subsection C. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference whether a burden is assigned or not. And I would certainly uh, be, a, would have no opposition being that language entirely, uh, subsections C2 and C3, as others have discussed, uh, and letting courts sort of figure out how to uh, get the evidence they need to make a finding. Uh, and that'll be, you know, the burdens will be litigated in that case. And I think that given the relatively small number of cases where that'll be relevant, I think that may be an appropriate resolution here. Um, so that, that's all I had on the bill for now and, and happy to answer any questions. Great, no, thank you, appreciate it. Any questions, Martin? So there is one issue that we haven't um, discussed as a committee yet, but we've had a couple different viewpoints on it and would certainly appreciate if you could weigh in on uh, where the AG's office is. And that's uh, whether to include the transitional provisions uh, in, in this bill uh, or not. And we've heard arguments on, on both sides of why it should or shouldn't be there. And I'm wondering if, if you have a position on behalf of the AG's on, with respect to that provision or those provisions. Sure, we have no objection to including the transitional provisions. I understand that there are folks who have concerns about that, that it will end up being a sort of blunt force transition uh, that may not be delicate enough or with enough attention to detail when it actually gets implemented. Um, I, I see the risk in that. I understand where that's coming from. I, I think that the con, you know, the the counter to that is that basically all it's doing is enacting the uh, policy decision that's been made or that is being made, I should say, around transitioning to this sort of tiered system, um, and I think that that will force consideration uh, for those areas where there may be some concern that the pre-existing pattern of the classes doesn't fit certain offenses. I understand again that folks are concerned that there won't be time or attention for that sort of fine-grained look at cases that, or, or crimes that may not fit neatly into the class system, the classification system, but um, we don't have an objection to it. I think that that's, a, that's less of a concern for us and would not have a problem with seeing it uh, go forward as is uh, in terms of including the transitional provisions. Um, but. We also certainly it certainly wouldn't change our support for the bill if that were to be altered or, or come out. So uh, we don't have a strong position on that, but I have no objection to seeing it continue in, in the bill. Thanks. Thanks. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so we. We still do have a little bit of time on this. Martin, do you want to start some 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I certainly I understand this is uh, up for discussion and possible vote tomorrow, but certainly if there are any uh, areas of concern or suggestions that we can put into um, hopefully the final draft uh, for tomorrow. Uh, my inclination, uh, given the testimony from everybody we've just heard from, is to uh, is to strike uh, subsection C2 and C3 on page three. Uh, I think that that seemed to be the, the consensus of, of the folks who are testifying. Uh, and that does make it uh, equivalent as far as my reading on, on the restitution, uh, that, that it's very similar if we take out those two provisions. So that's the one big change I'd have. And I'll throw out there right now. I mean, the rest of it, I, I think, is fine. Um, I do understand the concern about the fines, but I keep on hearing that it's really not a concern because the fines are not being imposed. Uh, th these uh, fines come much closer to really even where we are right now, particularly if you take into account inflation. Uh, so uh, that, that doesn't concern me and particularly since we're adding this language. And it's a, it's a give and take. I mean, we're, we're significantly addressing the situation uh, with respect to incarceration and uh, really going towards the so-called going rate, actual sentencing practices uh, with respect to incarceration. So I think this does a lot of good, this bill overall. And, and I'm somewhat ambivalent about transition, the transitional provisions. I, I'm leaning towards thinking that it's something that we should, we should include in, in the bill. So that's kind of where I am, but we'd certainly like to hear where other folks are and if there are any additional tweaks or changes to, to get everybody on board. Great, thank you. Selena. Um, yes, Martin, agree with you on um, the removal of the evidentiary burden sections around ability to pay. And I, I think I'd further suggest um, in line with the Defender General um, suggestions that we really track the language Oh, I feel like, oh, there you are, Martin. Sorry, my just tile rearranged and I thought you dropped off. That we track the, um, maybe think about even tracking more closely to the restitution language, which does, it has a little more detail on process, I think. Um, and then I guess I, I, um, I hear what you and other witnesses have said about the fines. And I guess the counter argument or question to that is like, if these fines aren't being opposed, why would we raise them for any crime? And um, I, I, I understand they're rarely utilized. And it also seems to me and, you know, reading and continuing to read and learn about the criminal justice system that, that fines and fees are some of the things that keep people trapped the longest sometimes. And so I guess I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around raising the pos pos possible maximum fines. Like I think the argument they're not, they're not being imposed works both ways. Um, happy to hear your thoughts on that Martin or anybody else. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Selena. Uh, yeah. No, Martin, you. Oh, um. Well, actually, let let's uh, let's hear from Bob. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> in listening to what everyone had to say in reference to the fines and restitution and so on and so forth, uh, the bill is proposed. Uh, personally speaking, it looks fine to me. I think we need to keep in mind that. The fines have gone down considerably, and this is only something that the judges could impose on a defendant. And we've talked about the ability to pay and not to pay. And if they do have the ability to pay, then that's why I think we need to still look at these fines as keeping them where they are so that they could impose those fines that for those individuals who do have the ability to pay. As far as sections two and three goes, <clears throat> I don't see any problem with uh, removing them uh, because basically in C1, it already assesses that the court shall consider the defendant's present and future financial ability before they assess a fine. So two and three seem to be a little bit redundant as far as I'm concerned. So I think if uh, the proposed fines, lowering of the fines, and elimination of two and three, and personally, I don't have a problem with the bill as it says it's written. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Martin? Well, yeah, I, I'm just kind of trying to go through and looking at uh, where the fines are. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, there's the possibility is that some of, yeah, certainly a number of them would potentially ra uh, be raised at least as far as the maximum. And, and, and more often than not, it has to do with the fact that it might be in a tiered system of the, you know, how much of the value of the property involved uh, in certain circumstances when it's a higher property value, the fine could be uh, higher. Uh, the, the cap uh, for the property times at this point, uh, to make clear, is $10,000. There's no, we, we don't have any, well, I'll take that back. I think we have a couple uh, class C felonies that we have in here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but other, most of them are not, Mo most of them are, we're talking about class E or class D felony at the outside. You know, if the value is $100,000 or more of property taken or destroyed. Uh, again, you know, again, the maximum, if max is $10,000. Um, so I think overall, yeah, it, it, on paper, it looks like some of these fines could be increased. Uh, again, I will also suggest that we're not that far off if you look at uh, the inflation rates for when when these offenses and fines were put on the books. And again, I haven't looked at all of them. Um, so yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from, Selena, as well. And, and uh, I also understand where Rebecca Turner is coming from as well. And probably, I, I don't understand the use of fines, period, uh, in the criminal justice system. But that's uh, a step too far, I think. And, and I think actually, significantly reducing the fine scheme that we have now uh, also may be a step too far for for uh, some folks. And, and I'm trying to have as much consensus on this as possible. But I understand where you're going. And, and you know, it, do we further reduce these? Uh, I'm ambivalent, but but it's it depends on where other people are. Okay, uh, Selena. Yeah, I think my question, and and maybe it's just, I mean, I I imagine it, you know, would there's a heavy lift just to determine it, but in the in the new version of the bill, where are the instances and how many of them are there where we've potentially raised the maximum fine? I mean, on balance, I really support the bill because we're we are trying to um, reduce sentencing and reduce fines to something that's at least more comparable to current practice. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, eliminates some of those outlying like potential maximum, um, potential maximum. So I, I think the bill, you know, collectively is it is a net gain in that way um but i guess the the devil might be in the details of where are the places where we've you know there's a handful of places i think where we've we've put raised the potential maximum sentence and to what extent have we done that for the fines and i think because this version of the bill is so new we don't have a perhaps don't have a ready answer to the degree of occurrence there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tom, your hand had been up. I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, uh, I did take it back down, but I, but I think I'll go ahead. Um, it, it's just kind of going through my mind that you know, my own opinion, I guess, that it, it doesn't really matter what the upper end of the fines are, um, in a sense. Uh, and, and the reason that I say that is that uh, the people who can't afford to pay it aren't going to be paying that anyway. Um, it's going to be pretty much predetermined what, what they're going to pay. And, um, and I, can, I can certainly uh, appreciate what Selena is saying and, and uh, anybody who thinks that the, the fine should be raised, like Martin was saying earlier, some of them go back to the 70s and 80s. And, and, 
And the people who are going to be paying those maximum fines are probably going to be able to, I don't know if afford it is the right word because uh, um, uh, depending on their situation, but uh, they're probably going to be able to afford it on some level. So um, as far as going back and changing everything, uh, um, just personally, I, I don't think it's necessary because of the, the safeguards that are in place for our low income people. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't know if I, I'm not seeing any other hands and I don't know if Barbara, if you wanted to, I know you were having some internet problems, but I wanted to see if you wanted to weigh in or, or Kate, I'm not sure if, if Kate is, is with us. Barbara, do you wanna weigh in? Sure, so I found um, the Defender General's uh, testimony compelling and I'm glad it sounds like we're incorporating that. Um, I guess if I had a preference, it would be to not um, have any fines go up, even though it's the going rate in other states. And I do understand that, but, um, and there's the caveat about ability to pay, but in some ways I'd love to see us move away from fines as a solution. Not that I have a great solution because I don't like incarceration, but um, I, I'm not persuaded by the going rate. Thank you. There you are, Kate. <laughs> to give you an opportunity to, to weigh in because I know this was an area of concern of yours. Um, and you're muted. Thanks. I had double protection, my phone and computer are muted. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate um, the committee taking the time to, to kind of double back around and, and reflect on the fines. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, I think this is a big improvement. Um, it's tricky because we're sort of throwing like darts at a dart board. Like there's no, we're sort of making things up a little bit here, um, which is always a complicated space to be in my mind and um, aware of timing issues. And I think, I think there's a desire to move forward with this bill and I respect that. I think it's a good, I think it's a good bill and I think it would be unfortunate in my mind um, to have it stalled or sit in any way because of the fine issue, especially considering that we've taken this time to kind of circle back around and reflect on it to this degree. Um, I think what helped me feel more at peace with it was um, the more explicit provision around affordability. Um, so, you know, that sits more comfortably for me, um, you know, if we felt like we could go back in between now and, and the time that's, that, that we need to move forward with this and, and really do like a deep dive into each of these areas, like that's, that's great. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's possible and maybe someone else can answer that. Um, but I think for me, for where it sits right now, I feel comfortable with it. Great, thank you. Uh, that, that's helpful. Anybody else? Uh, Ken, do you want to weigh in? Or have my mind. Can we vote on this today and get rid of this thing? <laughs> no, seriously. I'm like, seriously. It's like I'm not even going to say it. Well, I think we would need a, the very least, a clean draft. Uh, you know, to to vote on, but uh, I I think we could do this tomorrow. You know? Okay, so now I'm going to say it. We keep going. We're not going to put anybody in jail. We're not going to make anybody pay any money except the rich, which we already do in Vermont anyway. The rich pay everything, and that's why they all move out. There, I'm done. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> 
Kate. Yeah, I, you know, I can, I appreciate your comments and I guess it just sparks um, a thought for me, I think during the course of discussing this bill, I feel like there's been discussion around, like, I guess it has felt important to me in my own mind to make a distinction between restitution and fines and punishment. Um, and I, you know, because I, I, from what I've learned, you know, re so there's this issue of making whole the person who's been harmed, which in my mind is where restitution falls. Um, and I think it's, I, I think there's value in us looking at, uh, and then Martin and I started talking about this sort of the order um, that we, that money is paid out. You know, I think there's value in looking at whether restitution can be prioritized. I get the sense that there's pretty universal agreement that we want to support people who've been harmed. And I think that restitution is where that work falls. In my mind, fines and penalties, that, 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 that falls more in pu punishment for a crime. And what I've you know heard in testimony is that um, I guess where I, my mind goes in, no, in those terms is less about making someone whole who's been victimized, but more in terms of looking at, you know, how do we enhance the safety of our communities? And does massive fines and incarceration time actually make our community more safe? And what testimony continues to tell us is it, it doesn't. And so I think, you know, it's, it's in my mind, this kind of bill is trying to strike a balance of you know, honoring the needs of the people who've been harmed, but also trying to honor that our criminal justice system is imperfect and that some of the methods we've used to try to punish people into behaving differently have not been effective and have inequitably impacted certain people. And so I guess I just wanted to name that, that as we talk about this bill um, or, or maybe stop talking about it as <laughs> we might want to do, um, that we just make that clarification, or it's important to me to make that clarification between how we're honoring the needs of those who've been harmed and how we're essentially, you know, acting upon those who have done the harm. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That's helpful. Appreciate that. Uh, Ken, your hand is up. I'm just going to make one more statement. If you've ever been the victim, like I have on some of these crimes, you never forget, you never basically forgive, and certainly what it does to your family. And therefore, I'm not near as forgiving as, as a lot of people. I don't mean to sound cold hearted, but never forget the victim because most of the time it just doesn't go to the dad of the family it goes to the kids and it stays with them for the rest of their lives the victim of somebody that makes a bad mistake and hopefully they turn into good people the rest of their lives but i got news for you there's always going to be bad people out there and i'm now finally done oh Right. Well, not sure we, it's appropriate to be talking about good or bad people. Um, so, what was that? Uh, no, I'm not sure it's appropriate to be talking about good or bad people sometimes. You well, know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the proper words to use, but people that make mistakes and don't make mistakes or, or however you want to put it, that's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? They made a mistake, but still, it's a victim that's dealing with that that had their lives turned upside down or an invasion of privacy or something like that. That's what I'm trying to put out there for, for, for people to keep in mind and basically to be on record. Thanks. Great, no, thank you. Oh, Barbara. Sorry, because I was muted. So maybe I should not take your bait, Ken, but I do think that if we said, let's start, you know, we're getting rid of leeches and we're getting rid of um, 
I don't know, some other treatment because so what are we going to do with cancer victims? We, if we look at the evidence, neither incarceration nor fines are great deterrents. Maybe there are other reasons to do it, but it's a lot of money to, to do all of these things. And when we look at why people commit crimes, a lot of cases, it's we'd be better off really using the research and getting at the root of the problem rather than continuing to do things that are expensive and don't make our community safer, cost a lot of money that people have done. And um, don't bring back the, I mean, I love the reparations, but if it's someone who's murdered and I have had a relative murdered, it doesn't bring them back, you know? Thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I can't help but just jump in here a little bit because it's it's actually going to the core of what we have the criminal justice system for. And, and Ken is naming one of the primary, uh, in fact, reasons, and that's ret, uh, retribution. And, and that is something that historically has been part of the criminal justice system, as well as uh, deterrence, as well as protecting public safety by uh, keeping people out of the public who are really actually dangerous uh, uh, to the public, uh, and and also uh, re you know rehabilitation as well. But but go going to the concept of of evidence and such that I think increasingly there are there are studies that show the concept of retribution uh, that victims are more likely to get some sense of satisfaction or closure through a reparative uh, justice system. And, and there are studies that go there. It, it's, uh, but nevertheless, I, you know, I, I do recognize where, uh, where Ken is coming from. And that, that is, historically, that is something that is part of criminal justice. That's not necessarily should be the primary rationale for what we do. I think it's keeping the public safe and it's, and it's uh, you know, the reparative components of it, but in any event, uh, I just wanted to name that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Barbara's hand is probably up from, yeah. Okay, well, we're five minutes from adjournment and this is on our agenda tomorrow. Um, Martin, do you want to work with Eric in terms of the next uh, next draft? Uh, yeah, I, I, if it, with Eric here right now, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Eric, if uh, there's something else from what uh, Selena said that could be incorporated from the restitution. Uh, I mean, it didn't jump out at me at what else that would be, Selena, if, if there was, I mean, I thought the language just in C1 was fine, but if, if you had recommendations, it would have to be soon since we wanna to try to have a final draft to vote out tomorrow. I'm looking at the language again right now, Martin, and I can send something to an email to you and Eric with the, any suggestions that I have, if that sounds good. Yeah, I would think I, I would think so. I mean, I, I think the idea is to try to be close to what the restitution uh, provides. Yep. Okay, great, Eric. Is there anything that you need from from us? No, I think as far as I can tell, it's just that last little piece that um, Representative Coburn and Representative Belond have just mentioned about some parallel language with, I assume you're looking at 7043, 7043, is that the language you guys are looking at? 13 BS, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Whatever, whatever language you feel like you wanna add, just uh, yeah. let me know and I can do it. Okay, I I'll read it again. I thought I had seen a little more detail in there, like just a tiny bit more direction to the court, but um, let me read it. I was sort of reading and listening at the same time. So let me go back and read it when we're done and I'll give a section um, that I think it makes might make sense to track a little more closely. I'll, I'll shoot you and Martin and email and CC Maxine. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, um, 
Bob, so you, you have oh, your hand up. Thank you. So, so I thought we were looking at the elimination of C2 and C3. Now we're looking at a, a new draft with more language added to it. Yeah, thank you for bringing up Martin. Yeah. I think that, yeah, and, and I, I'm assuming just from my quick read of, of the restitution language uh, that it's really tweaking. It's not anything really significant, but if, you know, if it's not something that folks want to go with, you know, then we won't go with it. You know, we'll, we'll have a, you know, it's not, you know, we'll have a chance to look at whatever that is uh, tomorrow and, and have a discussion to see if folks are still on board or not. But I don't think from what I, my quick reading that there was really, it would significantly change what we have in C1 right now. Okay, all right, well, again, we'll take a look at it. Um, can I just ask, you know, if we can, uh, Eric, if we, on that language, if we can get something so that it can be sent out tonight so people will have it overnight to, to ponder uh, before we have it scheduled for a vote, if that's possible. I don't know if that's okay with your timing. Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but if, if you guys are looking at, you know, the, the sentence I'm looking at, you know, based on all finan financial information available to the court, including information provided by the offender, if it's something as straightforward as that. That's what I was just looking at. Yeah, that's what I was just looking at and thought it made right. sense track with because you get sort of rid of the burden of proof but you just make it really clear what the what the you know what is needed for the current court to i don't know right to substantially alter the language just tracks a little more closely as the defender general's office said with the case law and just gives this a tiny bit more direction to the court. In fact, it actually does, even though it doesn't create an evidentiary burden, it does make it clear the defendant has a role to play in supplying that information. Right. So yes, uh, as you response to the timing question, though, yeah, that's no problem. I can certainly get it out to folks tonight. And, um, I'm in Senate Judiciary on uh, firearms issues tomorrow morning. Uh, so I won't be available, but I can certainly get the draft to you guys so you can all look at it. And has this gone to the editors, uh, Eric? It has not. But the the only uh, there's very few changes between the bill as introduced and what you're looking at now. So I think they'll be able to move on it pretty quickly. All right. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Ken. Hi, I'm back. So <laughs> you're going to change this bill. You're going to make another draft of this bill? Is that what I'm hearing? Potentially. A, a, a proposed draft, yeah. Incorporating um, some of the uh, the comments and uh, discussion today. Yeah. We have to see a new draft because we're eliminating C2 and C3 anyway. And so it's a matter of clarifying C1 by this language uh, that you can find if you uh, look on the Vermont uh, statutes online at 13 VSA 7043 subsection B2 is the language that we're talking about. And it's just one sentence essentially uh, to clarify what the court is basing its determination on under C, under C1. But Ken, yeah, we have to have a new draft anyway because we're eliminating language from what we looked at today. Martin, I think it's subsection D2. Oh, I'm sorry, D. Am I wrong about that? No, that's right. OK, I'm just making sure we're looking at the same thing. So I don't, if that's where you're going, I don't need to actually send you an email. I think we just did. I think that would be my recommendation. OK. Right. So should I just do that, or do you, or do we need to? Do you want to further discuss that, the two of you, before I go ahead and just rework that paragraph, take out two and three, and essentially fold this sort of language in? 
I think send it to Selena and I, and I'll, I'll certainly turn it around real quick. Okay. Yeah, I can I can keep an eye out for it if you want, but that's, I mean, that's all I'm suggesting is just to track a little more directly to that provision. Yeah. And that, that seems to make sense. Um, and it starts to um, add continuity uh, to both sides of the discussion. I think so. Thanks, Selena. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Uh,